thank you for the introduction. So good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Martin Bishop, and this morning I'd like to talk to you about some of the research that myself and my colleagues are doing based in St. Thomas's Hospital, which is just about half a mile down the road, but it was based within the Department of Biomedical Engineering here at King's. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to construct computational and mathematical models of the heart to fundamentally try to stop so many people dying from sudden cardiac death and from heart attacks. Now, I realize that this possibly isn't the most Christmassy of messages, so I will do my best to kind of add a little bit of festive cheer to, to the proceedings as we go along. So first of all, I wanted to lead just with a quick question. How many of you in the audience have ever ridden a horse? Quick show of hands. I have. Name was Ginger. It wasn't very good. So how many of you ever stood near to a, to a horse? So I'm sure all of us can appreciate that horses are quite big, powerful animals. And it probably, you also probably realize that being kicked in the chest by a horse isn't a very nice thing to happen. No? How many of you would like to see a quick clip of someone being kicked in the chest by a horse? It's not gory or gruesome, but it does go quite quickly. So you ready? Three, two, one. Not a very nice thing to happen. So I'm not going to tell you at this point why I've just shown you that. But during the course of my talk, hopefully it'll become a bit more obvious why I've just shown you that clip. So an alternative title to my talk could be how to avoid being kicked in the chest by a horse. So in this morning's talk, I'd like to really cover, try, try to cover three things. First of all, I want to talk a bit about the heart, what it is, why we bother trying to model it. Then I want to say a bit about what these models are, because I know some of you are kind of budding physicists, mathematicians, engineers, and you want a bit of a meat and substance to the talk. And then I'll talk at the end about what we actually try to do with the models once we've gone to the trouble of actually creating them. So first of all, what is the heart? Now, the heart is fundamentally an electromechanical pump. Now, it's a muscle much like any other muscle in your body. So it responds to an electrical stimulus. An electrical stimulus causes it to contract. But in the case of other muscles, like your bicep, your bicep contracts because an electrical impulse runs from your brain down your nerves, and it causes it to twitch and contract. Now, thankfully for all of us, we don't have to have our brains tell our heart to contract. Because if we did, we might forget to do it if we're watching TV or if we're asleep or something. So that wouldn't be very good. So luckily for us, the heart delivers its own electrical impulse by this small collection of cells up at the top of the heart, which are called kind of the pacemaker cells. And these deliver this nice synchronized wave of electrical excitation, which starts in the top chambers. It spreads down these fast conducting fibers. And it spreads kind of upwards and outwards across the surface of the heart. And this is a very synchronized and uniform activation wavefront, which causes a very coordinated contraction of the heart which is what we want, because this is the most efficient way to pump blood around the body. So this is what the heart does. And this is what's called sinus rhythm. Now, just to show you that I wasn't lying with my kind of cartoon movie of the heart, this is a real life heart. This is the front. This is the back of the heart. Now, because we can't actually see electrical excitation, what we've done is we've used these special fluorescent electrically sensitive dyes. So these dyes basically glow up every time the heart gets excited. So you'll see it start off in the top. You'll see the top two chambers get excited. They'll glow. Then you can't see the activation because it propagates down the center. And then you'll see it spread upwards and outwards in a very nice, synchronized, rhythmical pattern. This heart isn't contracting because we've actually stopped it from contracting in this particular case because it ends up being quite hard to, um, to, to video it if, if it's moving. Now, we can also make computer models of this kind of thing. So we see this nice kind of movie of a sinus rhythm. And I'll say a bit more about this kind of thing and how we generate these models as the talk goes on. Now, hopefully, that was what was happening in all of you guys at the moment. Nice sinus rhythm, nice kind of coordinated, synchronized contraction of the heart. Unfortunately, sometimes this normal contraction sequence kind of breaks down. And we get these chaotic, fractionated, complex wavefronts, which characterize what we call cardiac arrhythmias. So now, instead of the heart beating in a synchronized way, these isolated wavefronts cause isolated regions of the heart to contract independently from one another. So it causes the heart to basically twitch, or what we call fibrillate. And this is a very, very, very inefficient way of pumping blood around the body. And if this happens, you're basically not pumping any blood around your body. And it's basically lethal within a few seconds, or maybe within a few minutes, if this isn't stopped. So again, we can also make models of this kind of thing. And we use these kind of experiments to try to relate back to the, to the simulations to check that what we're simulating is, is correct. And again, I'll talk a bit more about these kind of experiments as the talk goes on. So these kind of arrhythmias are very, very bad things. And they represent a huge health burden to kind of worldwide and also in the UK. Sudden arrhythmic death by these kind of cardiac arrhythmias kills millions of people worldwide. In the UK alone, it kills over 100,000 people every single year. 
And again, I appreciate that isn't the most festive of Christmassy messages to deliver, but the good news and the kind of festive cheer is that we're trying to do something about it. So as researchers, we're trying to construct these card computational models, and we're involved in other kinds of research to try to better understand these types of cardiac diseases such that we can try to treat people better. And this incorporates lots of different things, to try to prevent the disease occurring, to try to detect it earlier if it does occur, to try to improve the well-being of people that have this kind of disease, and also to kind of the economics of it, to try to lower the cost of treatment so that we can treat people more efficiently in terms of the NHS. So one of the problems with, with kind of modern conventional medicine is that we can't really do what we really want to do. So if someone presents themselves in hospital with a particular cardiac problem, they're complaining about something wrong with their heart, what we'd ideally like to do as medical professionals is to cut their heart out, cut it up into lots of tiny little bits, do lots of measurements and experiments, then we'd know exactly what was wrong with our heart, and then we try to stitch it back together and put it back in the patient. Now, patients usually aren't very keen on us doing that kind of thing to them. So we, we're a bit more limited in what we can do. So a lot of the time, we use a lot of different types of imaging modalities. So we do an awful lot of this kind of thing up the road at St. Thomas's. We use things like MRI, CT, ultrasound imaging, which a lot of you have probably heard of. Some of you may even have those kind of scans. And these allow us to kind of look inside the body and take pictures of the heart without actually kind of ripping it open and taking a look inside. We also use functional measurements. So we use things like ECGs and ultrasound, Doppler probes. So this kind of measures the electrical activity of the heart by just putting some electrodes on the surface of the chest. This measures the flow, the blood flow coming out the top of the heart using a, a type of ultrasound. Now this is all well and good, but again, it, it, we're a bit limited. We can't necessarily fully understand exactly what's going on just with this kind of information. So this is where computational modeling can potentially be quite useful. So we can construct a computational model directly from the imaging data from a particular patient. We can then parameterize it with the functional measurements that we make from this patient so that we end up with a patient-specific computational model of an individual patient. And this can basically act as an additional clinical tool so that we can now work with the doctors and we can try to let them understand using this kind of model how bad a particular patient's condition is or exactly what condition they have or try to guide them in their best kind of treatment for, this, for, this, for their particular problem. And I'll talk about how we make these. So now hopefully we understand a bit about what the heart is, why we try to model it. Now I wanted to spend a bit of time talking about how we actually put these models together. So if we talk about modeling something, so if I just want to, so it's quite a hard concept to think about, well, what is modeling? Well, if I wanted to model how this laser pointer moves if I throw it up in the air, we might need to write down some equations about gravity, about air resistance, maybe there's kind of a rotational aspect to it, and we can write down these equations, and then maybe they're a bit hard to solve together with pen and paper so that we code them up on a computer, and then we can model how, how, it, how it moves. Now maybe that isn't very useful because I could just measure how it moves. But maybe we want to know how this laser pointer moves if we take it to the moon, where gravity is different and the air resistance is different. So this is why we make these kind of models so we can see what's going on, but we can also try to use them in a predictive sense as well to kind of take it out of the normal level of, of the kind of parameters that it experiences. So in order to model it in the first place, we need to understand the physiology about what's going on. So cardiac cells are very specific cells in that they're electrically excitable. So what this basically means is that they've got a little membrane, which is shown in blue, which is the outer edge of the cell. And this membrane has got holes in, called ion channels. And so lots of different ions, like sodium ions, calcium ions, potassium ions, move into the cell and out of the cell on every heartbeat. And these kind of ions basically just come from the food. They come from the minerals that you eat. If you have cornflakes on your breakfast this morning, then you've got some calcium in your body. If you have some salt on your chips at McDonald's last night, then you've got some sodium. So all of these things are you kind of putting into your body, and these are vitally important for the way that a lot of the parts of the body function, and particularly cardiac cells. So during a, 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 any kind of heartbeat, the first thing that, come, that happens is that sodium rushes into the cell, and the cell get, goes from rest to being electrically excited. And then basically what happens is some calcium comes in, and this is responsible for the cell staying excited. And then at the end, potassium gets kicked out, and the cell comes back to normal. So there's constant movement of ions into and out of the cell, and this is occurring in every single one of your cells in your heart during every single heartbeat. And it occurs again and again and again and again. So this is what happens from a physiology point of view, but we're engineers or physicists or mathematicians, and we like to understand things the way that we understand things. So we take this kind of thing and we think about, well, what forces are at play in this kind of scenario? And there's two main forces that are important in this case. The first is diffusional forces. So diffusional forces is what causes something to move down a concentration gradient. So all of us in this room are quite tightly packed together. We're in quite a high concentration. And at the end of it, the doors will open and we're all going to rush out into an area of low concentration, which is outside in the foyer. So that's kind of what the cells do. They want to move to an area where there's a lower concentration. But these, the, sorry, that's what the ions do. But the ions are also electrically charged. 
So they also, if you're a positive charge, you don't like to move to somewhere that is already positively charged. You're attracted to somewhere that's negatively charged. So there's this constant interplay between the diffusion forces and the electrical forces, which is what underlies the movement of these, these ions into and out of the cell. And so because we're engineers, we like to understand this, how engineers understand it. So this is basically a cell, but we've just written it down as an electrical circuit, because this is fundamentally how it acts. So the membrane of the cell is nothing more than really just a parallel plate capacitor, which I'm sure you all know quite well about. And also the forces that govern the movement of these ions from out of the cell to into the cell, vice versa, are basically just, like I said, electrical forces, which is governed by things like Hooke's law, or diffusion forces, which is governed by something called Fick's law which again, some of you may have heard about, and also the movement of them actually across the membrane is nothing more than really Ohm's law. It's just the movement of an ion ionic charge, which is just an electrical current, and it's just flowing against the resistance because of a voltage difference. So this is just V equals IR, effectively. So we write down these kind of equations, and now we're at the stage where we can actually solve it, and when we solve it, we get these nice looking kind of excitation profiles, which is what's happening in all the cells. But that's what's happening at an individual cellular level, but obviously we want to understand things at the whole heart level, the tissue level. So individual cells are kind of coupled together in, together in what are called cardiac fibers. So just a bit like if you, if you poach a chicken breast and then you try to kind of rip it apart, you can see these kind of strand, these sinewy fibers in the middle of the chicken breast. That's kind of what the heart is as well. There's these long, thin fibers and all the cells are linked to one, to one another. And the cells are electrically connected to one another. So they're physically connected by these things called gap junctions, which basically mean that as this cell gets excited, it kicks a little bit of charge or some ions into this cell, which gets excited, and that kicks it to that cell. So you end up with this long train or a cable of excitation propagating from cell to cell to cell to cell. So that's what happens in the, phys in the physiology case. But again, in terms of if we're physicists or mathematicians, we want to understand it how we understand it. So we simulate this wave of spreading excitation down a cable as just basically thinking of a cell being a little unit, and these units are connected by resistances. So now we've got a network of resistances. So things now happen not just in zero dimensions, but we can happen in two dimensions or three dimensions, and we get this kind of cell to cell to cell to cell spread, which is what characterizes this wave of excitation, which is what I showed you at the start. So we can write down some equations, and I'm not expecting you to understand these, but these are what are called the bi-domain equations. And fundamentally, these, this top one just represents current flowing inside the cell, this one represents current flowing outside the cell, and this is just the potential difference between the inside and the outside. If any of you did understand these equations, then you pretty much know all you need to know about cardiac modeling, and in a few years, you'll be kind of uh, advancing the field forward. So now, we've, now we know the cells, the the equations that we want to solve, sorry, now we need to know how we kind of do this, and we, need, we basically need a geometry over which to solve it. And as I alluded to a little bit before, we usually get these geometries from imaging data. So we take some high resolution imaging data, we do some fancy image processing on it to figure out what's tissue and what's not tissue, and then we basically construct a three dimensional model which is constructed out of tiny little building blocks, and then we can do our simulations on it. So why do we construct it out of tiny little building blocks? Well, it's a little bit like if you take quite a complex looking function, and I say, well, I want you to represent that. And you think, well, that's quite a complicated function. But if you zoom in on a tiny bit of that function, then you can basically say that it behaves pretty much linearly in that small little zoomed in region. So then you go back to your function, and you break your whole function up into lots and lots of little bits. And then you can basically say that all those little bits are just straight lines. So now you've represented your whole complicated function by lots of little straight lines between little nodes. And that's exactly what we do in our heart. We basically take our heart model and we break it up into little bits. And by breaking it up into little bits, we can make what are called linear approximations. So that allows us to solve our equations a lot more effectively or a lot more easily. And then all we have to do at the end is stick all the solutions back together. And then we've ended up modeling the whole system. So hopefully now I've given you a little bit of insight into how we make these models. So now we need to think about, well, why did we bother? What can we actually do with these models once we've made them? So one of the first things that we do, and one of the most important things, is trying to understand these different kind of pathologies, trying to understand these different types of diseases using the models. And we work quite a lot with pharmaceutical companies and drug companies, because they invest billions and billions of dollars trying to develop one or two drugs that actually are effective at treating cardiac conditions. But there's a huge number of drugs that they develop that fail, because they end up being lethal or toxic and things like that. And so we can work with the pharmaceutical companies to simulate what the effect their drug would have. Because we've constructed the, the, the model from the level of the single cell and the ion channel and the protein level upwards, we can simulate the effect of that drug, which is, acts on the at the protein level, 
all the way up to the whole organ to try to predict whether that drug actually might not be very good and might kill people instead of cure people, so they should stop investing money into it right now. We also work with the kind of doctors that do imaging. So for example, if someone comes in for a heart scan and they have a picture that looks like this, which suggests that their heart isn't very healthy, but still that isn't enough information for the doctor. They don't know whether they need to operate on this person because they might have an arrhythmia tomorrow, or actually this person's gonna be okay for 20 years, and we should not put them through the trauma and the stress and the expense of a long procedure. So we can construct a computational model of this person's heart, and we can try to stratify risk to actually say how dangerous this person's heart is. We can also work with cardiac surgeons. So when a surgeon goes in to perform a procedure, they're often doing it a little bit blinded. They don't know exactly what they need to do or where they need to do it. So we can make models of it and we can try to guide them to say this is exactly the point that you need to do your procedure, which helps a lot and makes this procedure a lot more safe and a lot more effective in the longer term. Because the heart is an electrical device effectively, when it goes wrong, we tend to try to interact with it electrically to try to cure it. And one of the very common things that happens as people get older is this pacemaker. So you know I said at the top of the heart there's these little collection of cells, which are pacemaker cells. They can start to deteriorate and they can start to not function properly. So your heart doesn't beat as it should do. So people can receive what are called pacemakers, which is effectively a battery and a long wire that goes in and touches the heart somewhere and it delivers a little electrical impulse which causes the heart, beat to, the heart to contract and it to beat. Now these work really well, they're great, but often the surgeons don't know exactly where they need to position this little lead in order to make that patient's heart function in the best way. So we can make a model of this patient and we can try to tell the doctor exactly where they need to place that lead. Defibrillation is also really important. So when I showed you the movie of the, of the heart in, in, a, in an episode of an arrhythmia, really the only way to get someone out of an arrhythmia is to deliver a very strong defibrillation shock. So these external defibrillators are incredibly useful. If any of you listened to the news yesterday, there was actually a lot of, about them in the news. There's probably some outside in the corridor in case people have a sudden cardiac event. And what happens basically is you put some paddles here and here and you deliver a very strong electrical shock to the heart and hopefully it tries to reset the electrical activation and allows the, the, norm the patient's normal excitation um, to kind of regain and allows them to recover. Now this is all very well and good, but we don't really understand how it works. And so we need to hit the heart with a really strong electrical stimulus in order to try to guarantee that it is gonna work. So possibly more important than external defibrillators are what are called internal defibrillators. So these are a little bit like pacemakers, but they have the ability to shock the heart as well as pace it. Now these also have basically a little onboard computer. So they try to sense and they try to understand what's happening to the heart all the time. So if someone goes into an arrhythmia, then this device will know that they've gone into an arrhythmia and they can automatically deliver a strong electrical shock to try to cure them. So these are incredible devices. These have saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives worldwide since they were introduced a few decades ago. But they're also not optimal devices. So this is just a simulation of one of these devices in action. So this is just a slice through a heart, or one of our heart models, and there's an arrhythmia going on in the heart, and we're gonna simulate one of uh, these strong electrical shocks being applied through the heart, and you can see that this, in this case, the shock was successful. Now, like I said, these aren't optimal devices, and there's two main problems with these devices. The first is, because we don't really understand how they work, we end up having to use a really strong voltage, which means that the batteries drain a lot, and it has a lot of implications in terms of delivering a strong heart, a strong shock to the patient in terms of kind of damaging their tissues and things like that. Also, they tend to go off when they shouldn't. Obviously, if the patient's kind of keeled over on the floor and they're having an arrhythmic event and they're gonna die within minutes, then they need to go off. But very often, the patient might just be out Christmas shopping with their family, minding their own business, and suddenly, for some reason, the device malfunctions. My phone malfunctions all the time. Electrical things go wrong. But in this case, it can be quite catastrophic because suddenly it delivers a 300 volt shock to the heart and this patient jumps literally two feet up in the air and collapses on the floor. So patients with these devices have a lot of psychological issues because most patients receive one or two of these inappropriate shocks each year. So all the time they're thinking, am I suddenly gonna get hit by a shock when I don't want to? The other thing is when they do get hit by a shock, they're not unconscious on the floor, they're conscious. And so they can actually experience the pain and the feeling that these shocks give them. And the patients relay to us that these shocks feel like being kicked in the chest by a horse. So they're incredibly traumatic events. And by trying to do some research that we're trying to do, we're trying to understand the, these devices so that we can optimize them so that we don't have to deliver such strong shocks. So for example, we're using very high resolution CT data to construct not just models of the heart, 
but models of the whole torso. So we've got not just the heart, like I said, but we've got the skin, we've got the fat, we've got the rib cage, we've got the lungs, we've got all these different things in our, in our computational model, in addition to obviously the heart itself. And like I said, we're trying to do these kind of models because we're trying to simulate what actually happens in these devices. So we're trying to understand, we're trying to go from the imaging data to the model to actually simulate a shock being applied within a torso model in this kind of scenario. So we can try to do th two things. We can op optimize the placement of these electrodes, and we can also optimize the protocol. So maybe instead of hitting someone with one really big shock, maybe we could hit them with a series of little shocks, which would be just as effective, but it wouldn't be as draining on the battery, and it wouldn't be as traumatic to the patient. So I guess what we're trying to do ultimately is we're trying to use our models to try to avoid patients being kicked in the chest by a horse, or I guess because it's Christmas, it would work equally work well as being a reindeer. So with that, I thank you and I wish you all a Merry Christmas.